live in exciting times. In the past, the task of dealing with world perspectives was relatively easy. Because things were very quiet. And therefore, usually you discuss one or two countries. But if one looks at the world situation now, the whole situation has been entirely transformed. When was the next 23rd of June? When was the battle? Yes. In one day, in 24 hours, on the 23rd of June, the whole situation was transformed by one vote of the United Kingdom, which is, which is a catalyst. You know, that, you know that in chemistry, a process must be brought to a critical point in order, in order to reach that point. It requires a catalyst. One incident, one thing, extra, transforms quantity into quality. And that is what has occurred. And therefore, my task now is, is very difficult, almost impossible. Because there are major developments taking place everywhere. And the situation is changing rapidly, so rapidly, it takes your breath away. In Britain, for example, changing not, not by the day now, but by the hour. And that's true of many countries. And I have to apologize in advance. To the comrades in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Pakistan. One could spend an hour discussing just one of those countries. But as an international, we have to work out a global strategy. And we have to decide on the priorities of the international. This Congress has to decide where is the central point of the world revolution at this particular time. About a decade ago, we decided that the center of the world revolution was Latin America. And that was quite correct. But you see, there's a change now. Not to say that there are not important developments in Latin America. There are. I think particularly in Brazil, we must watch the situation closely for, for, for two reasons. Subjective and objective. Brazil is a giant, it's the giant of Latin America. And it, it, it was a, a powerful force for, the, for, for industry and for, for the economic development for the whole period. On the basis of a boom in world capitalism. Which lasted maybe two decades. But dialectically, and you see this everywhere now, dialectics teaches us that sooner or later things change into their opposite. Brazil now is in the deepest slump, I think, that one could remember. And this is, has, has profound effects in society, 
in consciousness, and in politics, where you see there's a convulsive situation in politics. And you saw the revolutionary potential of the Brazilian workers and youth. If I remember correctly, just two years ago, with a marvelous, spontaneous insurrection. And that is a warning of things to come in Brazil, where we are very fortunate in having a very strong organization, it's particularly strong in cadres, experienced cadres. who have, in my opinion, have adopted the correct tactics. And therefore, Brazil is one of the things we should discuss in detail. But unfortunately, at this moment in time, it's not possible. Because I believe we must center all our attention at this moment on Europe. which has now become the key to the world revolution. I have before me two copies of The Economist, a serious journal of the British bourgeoisie. Probably you can't see them, the hole is too big. Maybe you can see them. This is The Economist of the 2nd of July of this year. You see what that says? Anarchy in the UK. Okay. Yes. You see uh, the, the British flag, the Union Jack, flying at half mass in rags and tatters held together by pins. Then you have The Economist of last week, July the 9th. It's a different color. It said, The Italian Club. It's the name of a film, if you didn't know. Gat film. Very appropriate in Italian politics. It's full of gangsters. It's a bus... I believe the bus is made in Britain, I'm not sure. With, with, with the colors of the Italian flag, the little British bus has already fallen off the cliff. And the Italian bus is just tottering on the brick, ready to fall after it. The Italian job, it says, Europe's next crisis. You know, it often happens that the strategists of capital frequently come to the same conclusions as the Marxists from their point of view. From their point of view. At this moment in time, and this is amazing, what I'm saying to you is something amazing. I'm amazed myself. Britain was the most stable country in Europe. Even the economic crisis was not too bad. But in Spain and Greece and Italy, no, many young unemployed people from Europe, they, they went to Britain to, to find work. Now Britain is the most unstable country in Europe. It changed into its opposite. And it changed it its opposite in a question of 24 hours. 
What is the nature of the period that we have? The most convulsive and turbulent period in human history. And uh, in, in such a period, the main feature is precisely sudden and sharp changes in the situation. Which every section must prepare for. Mustn't, have, mustn't be thinking about what happened in the past. The past is gone. Forever. And you must be thinking, oh, not much is happening in my country. Not, not much was happening in Britain. Even a couple of months ago, not much was happening. Except in the Labour Party, but I'll deal with that later. We must, comrades, we must be prepared for sudden and sharp changes. And we must expect the unexpected. So that we're not taken by surprise. Now it is customary in uh, the discussion of international perspective. To begin with economic analysis. And if there are comrades who come here prepared with stacks of statistics about the world economy, I am afraid I will disappoint you. I intend to depart from normal practice. Keep your uh, statistics for next year or the year after them. Because I, I take the, 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 the obviously, for, for us as Marxists, obviously, it is ABC. But the basis of all this uh, situation is precisely the economy. inability of the capitalist system to develop the productive forces as they did in the past. That is, that is what has destabilized everything. You can date this, of course, from the crisis of 2008. They never recovered from that. We were constantly saying, oh, there's a recovery, there's a recovery. You remember the green shoots? The green shoots? Where, where are the green shoots? There are no green shoots. We can't get out of this crisis. And I, I remember, I remind some of the comrades that were present, What did we say in 2009? We said the following. It's like a kind of equation, if you like. The bourgeoisie is struggling to recover the economic equilibrium, which was destroyed in 2008. And we said, and we said, all the attempts of the bourgeoisie to restore the economic equilibrium will destroy the social and political equilibrium. You think about it. That is precisely what has happened. And that's the reason for the present uh, instability and chaos. Now, we take uh, 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 what we can say is this: in the last, even in the last few weeks, 
to use a geological analysis, anal analogy and apply it to politics and society, the tectonic plates have shifted. Everywhere, on a world scale. And when this happens in geology, it is accompanied by explosions, by earthquakes. And now, now we see the tectonic plates of change in society. And that, and that is accompanied by, by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. But you see, what causes the movement of the tectonic plates in geology is what occurs beneath the surface. You can't see it on the surface. On the surface everything is calm and solid and quiet, nothing happens. You know, it, we have a saying in the English language. As solid as the ground under my feet. The problem is the ground is not solid under our feet. This, this apparent uh, solid surface of rocks and earth is very thin actually. You know how thin it is? It is thin of the skin on an apple. And, and, this, and this thin crust is all that separates us from a mass of molten rock at un unimaginable temperatures and unimaginable pressures which is seeking a way out It's seeking a weak point in the crust. And sooner or later it will find that weak spot. And it will break through. Shattering this apparently solid surface. In the most cataclysmic events known to humankind. Now there's a precise analogy between geology and, and, and sociology, if you like. Beneath the surface of apparent calm, apparent peace and quiet, there is a seething mass of discord in the masses, in the masses. There is an enormous accumulation of discontent, of anger, of fury, of indignation, of bitterness, and above all of frustration, because they cannot find a, a, a way to express this feeling. The mass reformist organizations, both the social democracy and the so-called communist parties and ex-communist parties, and above all the trade unions, are acting like, a, a, are trying to suppress the, 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 the real mood of the class. We 
these so-called realists who have the audacity to call the Marxist utopians are a thousand miles removed from reality. They have no conception of reality. They're not the face of the working class. The reformists are not the face of the working class. They're the ass of the working class. And this part of the anatomy hasn't got a great level of comprehension. But you see, certain things flow from this. The crisis of capitalism is also the crisis of reformism. Of course, as night follows day, as long as the capitalist system was going forward, it was able to grant certain concessions. Of course, under the pressure of the working class, of course. Working for this, the ruling class never gave us anything. It had to be fought for. But on the basis, of, on the basis that they could give concessions, they did give concessions. Quite considerable concessions in the past. Even in Spain that was the case. In Britain you had huge concessions after 1945. Free health, free education, all these things, important, important gains. Cheap houses. And therefore the workers said, well, you know, the present system is not very good, but it's also not too bad. And the labor leaders are doing a good job. Let's trust them. Let, them. let them get on with it. Even in America you have this mentality. Although there was no, re there was no reformist workers party. But there was full employment. Rising living standards. All oh, things were not too bad, so why rock the boat? And in, in the United States, it, fairly recently, nobody would seriously question the capitalist system. That is not the situation now. I hope that the American people will speak. I hope to hear the American, if time permits. And I hope I've got the statistics right, otherwise John will correct me. Yes. According to the opinion poll, and this was last year, a year ago, before the current, the, 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 the uh, Sanders campaign, 67% of American youth said that they would vote for, for, a, for a socialist president. And one article said, well, don't worry, things are not too bad. Because the older people, over 65, Only 34% said they would vote for a socialist president. I mean, good God. I consider that statistic to be more important than the other one. After generations of massive propaganda against socialism, against communism, and so on, The 
the fact that uh, 34 percent of people above the age of 65 said that they vote for a socialist president. That represents a fundamental change of consciousness in America. That very important events are taking place in the USA. Even now, as I speak. Of course, I think John will be with when he, when he speaks. Now, this, this instability is at all levels. Economic, social, political, diplomatic, military, and you, you see on a world scale, the, the, contradic the enormous contradictions in the world, rela world relations. To look no further in the Middle East. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and, and uh, Israel are the three main counter-revolutionary forces in the Middle East. And they've been actively supporting, arming, and financing these jihadi madmen, these jihadi gangsters. Against Assad. But the fact is they've been defeated. The, uh, the Syrian army has now surrounded Aleppo. It's bombing it, of course, uh, naturally. And it's only a matter of time before it falls. Aleppo is near to the Turkish border. And I, and I will deal with Turkey in a moment. The Turks, Erdogan was threatening. We'll intervene. If you take Aleppo, we will intervene and send the army. Which they could do because the army, the Turkish army is just across the border. And these gangsters in Saudi Arabia, these degenerate, crooked bastards in, 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 uh, in Riyadh, defenders of, this, of Islam, Defenders of the, uh, the holy cities, who spend most of their time in the, time in the brothels and bars and nightclubs of London and Paris. With prostitutes and drugs and all the rest of it. The most degenerate, repulsive gang you could think of. Ah, we, Saudi Arabia will intervene. And I, said, I thought to myself, don't quote me in the privacy of my own home. I thought, let them intervene, let them intervene. Because they would have been crushed, smashed by the Russians. Putin was just waiting for his revenge because they shot down the Russian train. Of course, they did not intervene. But of course, the situation, unfortunately, in Syria and Iraq now, the situation is a terrible situation. But the the mass of massive the people have got to suffer these terrible atrocities. That in turn produces a flood of millions of desperate refugees. Fleeing... Uh, war and misery and poverty coming to Europe nice civilized Christian democratic Europe which welcomes them with razor wire and, uh, and uh, uh, gas tear gas and transients 
And that's the real face of the uh, democratic capitalist European Union. It's, it's a counter-revolutionary situation on Syria and Iraq. And we have to seek the solution to that, I think, not inside Syria and Iraq, but outside of these countries. There are three countries in that area where the working class has, has a crushing preponderance of the population. Those countries are Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. In, in, in Egypt, you saw the marvelous revolution, the power of the masses was shown. How easily the masses overthrew, not just uh, Mubarak, ferocious dictatorship, but also the other Muslim gangster. What was his name? Morsi, the, 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 Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood. Actually, when, when they overthrew Morsi, 17 million people were on the streets of Egypt. There was, ne there was never that in the Russian Revolution. And really speaking, in Egypt, power was lying in the streets, waiting for someone to pick it up. And the tragedy, the, the terrible tragedy of the Egyptian Revolution, the fundamental difference, the only difference with the Russian Revolution, was the absence of what we call the subjective factor. A revolutionary party and a revolutionary leadership. If at that moment there would even have been a small party, the Bolshevik party in February only had 8,000 members. in a country of 150 million inhabitants. But that party was able to take power in nine months. On the basis of correct tactics and a correct program. But that factor was absent in Egypt. And as a result of that, there was a power vacuum and the army stepped in. Under this gangster Sisi. And therefore in Egypt, temporarily, temporarily, the, the movement has gone down. But I predict now that it will come back. Because th this regime is not capable of solving any of the problems of the, of the Egyptian people. Therefore, we have to keep an eye on Egypt. In Iran, there's been major developments. There's a, there's a hatred of the regime of the Mullahs. There's a powerful working class, which is not still a force. And again, my advice to you is. In relation to Iran, watch this space. The Iranian revolution can transform the whole of the Middle East. It can transform the situation in Pakistan, Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan and so on. But that brings me to Turkey. Again I repeat. Sharp and sudden turns in the situation. Erdogan is again a gangster of the worst sort. His regime is completely rotten, corrupt, and reactionary. And he's got big ideas, big ambitions. 
I sometimes think he's a little bit mad. He's not very intelligent. But he's cunning like an Anatolian peasant. Be cunning. He's cunning. Not clever, but cunning. There's a difference. He has big ambitions. To take over Syria. That's why he wanted to overthrow uh, Assad. He wanted to take over Azerbaijan and so on, and the, the Caspian area of the Soviet Union. And Central Asia, with all its oil and its wealth. In other words, what he wanted to do was to re-establish the Ottoman Empire. Oh yes, you don't believe me. You think I'm exaggerating. He built a palace. You know, this man is an Islamic person, modest and humble. And, you, know. you know how big this palace is? You know the, you know the palace of Versailles in, in France? Yes. That's pretty big, isn't it? Erdogan's palace is ten times bigger than the palace of Versailles. Imagine it. Imagine it. I believe it cost 350 billion pounds. Paid for, paid for by the people of Turkey. And you saw the reaction against Erdogan two years ago with this spontaneous uprising. Mass demonstrations and protests all over Turkey. Clashes with the police. And every young regime was, was, was in crisis, it was, it was in the point of being overthrown. So what did he do? What did he do? To strengthen his regime. To save himself. He provoked a war with the Kurds, with the PKK. Deliberately. Which Ajalan and the leaders of the PKK did not want, they were desperate to avoid it. Prepared to make any concession. But Erdogan launched this uh, bloody war against the Turks, against the Kurds. He was also terrified by, we'll deal with the nationalism and the national question. Kurdish question. But he was terrified by the movement of the Kurds in, inside Syria. In effect, they've got uh, autonomy. They've got almost independence in, in, in practice. But he, he launched this adventure in Syria And now we see the results. This terrorism that are bombs in, in Turkey every minute. And in the end, first of all, he shot down a Russian plane. The order came from him. It's clear to me the order did not, it wasn't a local thing, it came from him. Because the Russians were bombing the supply routes where ISIS was, supplied, was selling oil to the Turks for large amounts of money. So Erdogan has asked, he said, shoot it down. So they shot it down. And Putin is responding. He could have bombed them, actually. He could have bombed, bombed hell out of them. But he obviously thought that that wasn't the best thing at that moment. He's not, not a stupid man, Putin. He's a bastard, but he's quite a clever bastard. They're the worst sort. He 
said, no, let's strengthen them economically. Cut off the trade, cut off the tourism. Which, which, which hurt them a lot. Now Erdogan is compelled to make a humiliating apology to Putin for shooting down this plane. That may have been the spark for this coup. It might have been the spark for the coup. Which took place in the last few days. Now the rest of my lead off will be devoted to Europe, as I said. Of course, at the bottom, we know at the bottom of this, there's the economic crisis, mass unemployment, and the, the real danger now of a further deep slump, perhaps in the next 12 months. The whole thing is very fragile, and even the slightest shock can bring the whole thing crashing down. And what occurred on the 23rd of July in, in Britain was not a slight shock. But June, June, that's right, June. Brexit was a, a devastating blow to capitalism in Europe and worldwide. And the, the reason that they're so panicky, the reason they were, they're so nervous, is that in the event of another slump, another recession, the bourgeoisie does not have any weapons left, any instruments left to solve this, to get out of it. The communists know what, what, what these weapons are. Basically, there's two ways in which they can combat a slump. One, one, is, one is to reduce the rate of interest, to stimulate investment and spending and credit and so on. The problem is that they can't use this because they've already used it up. Interest rates everywhere are at, 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 at historic lows. Sometimes when I read the analysis of the bourgeois economists, I scratch my head. The, the chief economist of the Bank of England, in a study which he wrote a few months ago, said that the rate of interest now is lower than any, than any other time. No, no, I didn't say that. At any other time. In the last 5,000 years. How the hell could they work that out? You're talking about Hammurabi or I don't know. Anyway, that's what he said. That's what he said. But in, in any case, what is true is that historically speaking, the rate of interest is about 5%. It has been for a long time. Now it is zero or close to zero. Uh, so, so, they, so how can they reduce the interest flow? What, what effect would that have? The other alternative is to increase state spending. That's the, the Keynesian idea. But how can you increase state, the state expenditure with these huge mountains of debt? On the contrary, they're all talking about cutting the deficit. Although I think in desperation, in the short run, they might, they might do that. They might, they might try that. But there's limits to that. They can't continue to borrow and borrow. Now, on top of all this, these problems, there was the Brexit result in Britain. Which is a sharp change in the situation, which nobody expected. 
Cameron didn't expect it. And the leaders of the Brexit campaign was at least expected. Cameron went to bed, convinced that he'd won. Nigel Farage, who's the, the racist advocate of Brexit, said the same that he said that he thought that they'd lost. But Cameron woke, woke up the next morning. He was no longer prime minister. And Britain was out of the Economic Union, the European Union. People were stunned. They were all stunned. By the way, the Brexit crowd didn't have any plans. Nothing, no plan for them. Because they were expecting to lose. Now, the question, the question is going to be asked, why did this happen? By the way, the Brexit campaign was completely reactionary, be sure of it. The main card, the main emphasis, particularly in the last phases of the campaign, was anti immigration. Blame the immigrants. There's no jobs, blame the immigrants. You don't know how to blame the immigrants. Look at all these Poles and Eastern Europeans coming and taking, Romanians taking our jobs. So there was a very reactionary element in that country. And that played a big role. But it would be wrong just to emphasize just that aspect. You see, there were many people in the, the, north of, the north of England and Wales, where I am from, where for, 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 for decades there's been the, the destruction of industry, closure of the mines, coal mining has been destroyed, steel industry has been destroyed, shipbuilding has been destroyed, Whole communities have been destroyed. Whole communities have been destroyed. And therefore, when the, when the pro-European crowd said, we're better off in Europe. Well, people in uh, Newcastle, they didn't know, it, it sounded like Chinese. And at the bottom of this, you saw this earlier in Scotland, when it took the, the form of a vote for nationalism and for breaking away from Britain altogether. I'll go back to my earlier analogy. Beneath the surface of these places, there was an enormous accumulation of discontent, of anger, of bitterness. And also a sense of alienation. A sense of rejection. No, nobody cares about us. These people in Westminster don't care about us. And this was an opportunity to give the establishment a good kicking. Now, there's something progressive in that. So you could say that the, it was mixed up in the mixed elements. Actually, in the campaign, there were progressive and reactionary elements on both sides. That's why the British section decided to be out of our position. But we cannot support either side in this debate. This is a division between the ruling class in Britain and the Tory party in particular.
I will, it was necessary to defend an independent class position on the basis of the slogan No to the capitalist European Union. Yes to the sources the United States of Europe. Which had, had a reasonable echo among the advanced layer. The people that we're trying to reach. And I won't say anything more. That this is a separate item on, on the question of Brexit. But the most important thing that we must bear in mind, because we see the same phenomenon repeated in, in many countries, is what Trotsky called, in a brilliant phrase, the molecular process of socialist revolution. This slow accumulation of discontent in the masses Which eventually reaches a critical point when they say, that's it, no more, finish. We have enough. There's an enormous discontent in all the existing parties. That was shown in Britain even before this Brexit business last September. Last September, in this amazing situation, where Jeremy Corbyn was elected leader of the Labour Party, with the massive support of about 60% of the members of the party, which transformed the situation. Because for decades before that, for decades, maybe 30 years, 30 years, the Labour Party was completely and absolutely dominated by the extreme right wing. Tony Blair and his uh, faction were openly bourgeois politicians. And I would say that until about 12 months ago, a little bit more, the Labour Party, was, as we say, was as dead as a dodo. Dead. No life in it whatsoever. But the emergence of Corbyn, what it showed, is precisely this question. The workers of the youth were looking for some point of reference. The workers and youth need a point of reference. In America that's been provided uh, until recently anyway by uh, Bernie Sand Sanders. Which I hope to deal with it a little bit. But in Britain there's been a massive response to, to Jeremy Corbyn. Despite the fact that of course he's not a Marxist, he's a left reformist. With the usual confusion and vacillation of any left force. We don't have any illusions in Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, we know him actually. Robert Mercer knows him. John MacDonald, the second in command, we know him very well. And we know their limitations. And we saw what happened with Cyprus in Greece. Yes, 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 we know all that. Don't, please don't remind us, we know this. Don't need to be reminded. Yes, but, what's the position now? The right wing, which completely dominates the parliamentary Labour Party, is determined to get rid of Jeremy Corbyn. The situation is particularly problematic now because the Tory party is in crisis. 
to be clear about this, the conservative body is split right down the middle. On the question of Europe, the right wing, uh, the pro business wing, the city of London, of course, is all in favor of the capitalist European Union. But there's another wing, a sovereignist, a Thatcherite wing, which we call, which, which are known as the Little Englanders, the Little Little England, who have the delusion in their heads. They're quite mad. They've got a delusion in their heads that Britain can become great. Get the empire back. So look out Pakistan, we're coming for you. And of course it's nonsense. Britain lost its empire and its law, it lost its, its, its economic power a long time. It's now a relatively unimportant little island off the coast of Europe. But for the Tory right wing, no, they don't accept this. But th there's a bitter struggle between these two wings. They hate each other. And this referendum was called by Cameron only for one purpose. To solve this split. It hasn't solved this split, it's made it, made it a thousand times worse. And it is quite possible that the Conservative Party might split. It's possible. Between these two wings. Especially if, as I think is probable, they try to stitch up some kind of a deal with, the, with Merkel and co. To liquidate the result of the referendum somehow. That will put the cat among the pigeons. The present Tory government is a very weak government. And of course there could be new elections. They say, they say you know, the, the press is saying all the time, Jeremy Corbyn is unelectable. The British people will not elect the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. I think that's not what that's not what they're worried about. But the contrary, it is entirely possible if elections are called in the next few months, with a split in the Tory Party. The Labour Party can win under Jeremy Corbyn. That's what they're worried about. Yeah. Of course, uh, they're not worried about Je Jeremy Corbyn himself. They understand, like us, they understand the limitations of, of the forms. But they're terrified of the movement, the mass movement that's building up behind Corbyn. Therefore, immediately after the referendum result, the right wing of the parliamentary party attempted, attempted to stage a parliamentary coup. They, res they all resigned from, from, the, uh, from Corbyn's cabinet, opposition cabinet. Then, then they launched a vote of confidence just look at the result. 172 Labour MPs voted against Corbyn. No confidence in Corbyn. 172. And about 40 voted for. They put extreme pressure on Corbyn. And in fairness to the man, he showed some kind of, he stood against this. 
vicious campaign in the press. And the reason why he sustained himself is because he feels behind him a massive support from the party members, from workers, from youth, and even from the trade unions, from the new members precisely. Yes. In what period of the week is that? Yeah. Just listen to this. In two days, 182,000 people joined the Labour Party. In two days. And the overwhelming majority will be to support Corbyn. This is unprecedented. I've never seen it in anything like it. Labour Party membership now is more than half a million. Nearly 600,000, Rob corrects me. It's the biggest political party in Britain. In Europe. In Europe, yes. That's happened in a matter of, 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 of months anyway. There's a mood of absolute fury. Absolute fury. In the local Labour parties. And in the trade unions. I'll give you an example. Brighton, you know Brighton? Alex knows Brighton, he's from there. It's a little, it, it, it's a medium-sized coastal town. It's a holiday resort. On the sea. Very pleasant. I went to university there. Very nice. But it's hardly Petrograd. Hardly Petrograd. They just had about what, ten days a week ago. About a, one week ago, a little bit more than a week ago. They had their annual general meeting. Normally you'd expect about what, 30, 40, 50 maybe. You know how many people turned up? About 800. They couldn't fit in the hall. They had to hold the meeting in three separate stages. And, and when the vote was held, when the vote was held for the, for the party officers and so on, all of them were pro-corporate. The right, right wing was kicked out. You know, comes our tendency, Ted rather this tendency, predicted this what, 50 years ago? More. It's, a, it's exactly what we predicted. In Liverpool, they not only had a, had a meeting of about a, almost a thousand, but when the meeting finished, they marched to the streets in a demonstration. Pardon? Rob corrects me, there were 3,000. And the same all over the country. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, and the union is the same. The union is the same. Originally the trade union bosses, I think including Cluskey, the, the left wing, McCl Len McCluskey is a left. McCluskey is the leader of the biggest trade union, I think it's the biggest union in Europe. How many members? Pardon? One and a half million members in one union. Mainly industrial workers. But I have reason to believe that McCluskey was it, thinking into, well, maybe Corbyn is a bit too left and we must try, try and get him out somehow, eventually. But such was the mood of the rank and file. Absolute fury. But the trade unions, uh, they couldn't do this. Now they've come out decisively in favor of Corbyn. And it'll be difficult for them to, I think it'll be difficult for them to retreat. 
uh, will very likely be, I, I can't see how they, they could avoid a split in the league. As happened in, in 1931, that's an interesting historical parallel. Trotsky wrote about that. And he said that Britain at that time was in a pre-revolutionary situation. But there's a, there's a difference. At that time, it was only a minority of the parliamentary Labour Party that fused with the Conservatives, joined the Conservatives in the national government. And they held a, a, a snap, ele a quick election, general election. And the parties of the national government won a sweeping victory with the usual slogan of national unity, a strong government, and so on. At that time, the Labour Party was liquidated. It was, uh, not, not liquidated, but it was, it was uh, reduced to, to a small group in Parliament. But in opposition, the Labour Party swung far to the left. But there's a massive shift now towards the Labour Party. More correct, not towards the Labour Party, but towards Corbyn. Not the Labour Party. Uh, and therefore, there'd be an, in, in, in my opinion, you could have a, a repetition. History does repeat itself, but not quite in the same way. The difference is that whereas at that time only a minority of the, the Labour crossed the floor, this is John the Conservative, this time the overwhelming majority of the parliamentary party was split. And under those circumstances, of course, with the support of the bourgeois press, the television, the mass campaign, and so on, Labour would suffer a defeat, would be pushed into opposition. But there also history can repeat itself. But under those conditions, in opposition, and under conditions of a deep crisis, the Labour Party could, could swing far to the left. But from everything that I've said, the position in Britain is quite clear. It is now one of the most unstable uh, countries in Britain, in, in Europe. You don't believe me? Let me just quote with what The Economist says about Britain. It says, British society resembles a bubbling cauldron of discontent and uncertainty. That is a perfectly accurate description of the situation. But I've said, I've said enough about Britain, but only, only for lack of time. Now, Brexit, of course, is a, a, a deadly blow to the European Union, which was already in a very fragile state. If you look at the, the basis of the, of, the, of, the, of, of the movement towards European integration, it is based on two things, two fundamental pillars, the Euro and the Schengen Agreement. Now some people, for example, some people in the Remain camp, the people who wanted to stay in the or I tell, tell you, people in the Brexit camp, saying, well, we, we, we can't be in Europe because it, they, they're going to create a, a monster, a European super state dominated by Germany and so on. Well, that was the plan of the Germans, that's true. But just look at the facts. The movement towards European integration even before Brexit, 
has been stopped in its tracks and is going it sharply into reverse. And that bears out what Lenin said when he predicted and Trotsky said the same thing. Of course we are in favor of the unification of Europe. Of course we are. But Lenin stated that on a capitalist basis that is impossible. He said it was a reaction a, 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 a a united capitalist Europe, he said, was a reactionary utopia. The reactionary character of the EU is perfectly plain. You see the treatment of the Greeks. Viciousness they showed towards the Greek people. And towards the Tsipras government. And the monstrous austerity plans. Yes, but it's also utopia. We pointed out, I, I actually wrote a document in 1997, which I think should be reprinted by all the sections, called A Socialist Alternative to the, to the uh, European Union. You read that document. And I believe I would not have to change a single line or dot or comma. What I predicted is what's occurred. The euro is in a, the euro is, is in a mess. And probably will not survive. The Greek crisis has not been resolved. Not in the slightest degree. And if you look at Schengen, well, it's, uh, it's, it's in ruins. Particularly since the influx of refugees. So the idea of some kind of massive capitalist state is complete nonsense. It was, it was already in the process of breaking up. And now with Brexit, there's been enormous uh, impetus to the centrifugal tendencies. But you see, to go back to what the economist was predicting, there's a crisis in every country in Europe. Greece is an extreme case. And I say it's not resolved. Britain is, is now in a deep crisis. Our next on the agenda will be Italy. We can agree with the uh, eco economist on something. Italian capitalism after, uh, after Greece is the weakest link in the chain of European capitalism. Just look at the figures. The public debt in, the, in, in Italy is 135% of gross domestic product. The level of adult employment, not unemployment, employment, is lower than any country in the EU except for Greece. The economy has been stagnant for, for a long time, for years. Italian capitalism cannot compete with German or French or, or British capitalism. But the most serious element of the equation is the crisis of the banks, which has, I think, Yes. Bad debts, total bad debts of the, of the banks. Uh, 
amounts to 360 billion euros. which is 20% of the gross domestic product. The, the big banks in Italy lost one half of their value since April. And still more after Brexit. I haven't seen the latest figures. Still more after Brexit. The Monte del Pasque di Siena, I hope I pronounced it okay, which is the oldest bank in the world, is worth only 10% of its book value, of its, of its uh, formal value. It's on the point of collapse. The situation is extremely serious. And without a huge injection of, of money from, from the state, from the government, The danger is a collapse of the banking system in Italy. It should have extremely serious effects. Especially because very many of the investors in the banks are small, small business people, little class people as well. In other words, you could have a situation like Argentina. The bourgeoisie needs a government, a strong government in Italy to carry out cuts. The trouble is, like in Spain, they can't have a strong government. And therefore, this, this, uh, the, the, the government can't give this money to the banks because the EU rules, the Eurozone rules, prohibit it. Not allowed. So therefore, they're trapped. And therefore, you can have extremely revolutionary developments taking place in Italy. But the point, I, the point I want to stress is just look at this process in France. A massive swing to, to the left in, in, in the electoral front is followed by what seems to be a massive swing to the right. And, I, and I'll predict now that all our friends on the ultra-left sects will bring out the tom-toms <laughs> fascism fascism in France you know well I mean these guys have got, have got, have got to do something to amuse themselves haven't they we always find something to rave about. And we must be absolutely clear. Well, first of all, Marine Le Pen is not a fascist, actually. The father, if he wasn't a fascist, he was a very good imitation of a fascist. But uh, Marine Le Pen has got a little bit more up here than her dad. She purged the party of the, the extreme fascist uh, elements. And now she's become respectable. Marine Le Pen is not a fascist. She's a right-wing, uh, xenophobic, racist. Uh, you know, she's all of those things, yes. But of course, the National Front... Can, be, uh, can prepare the way for, for a fascist movement in the future? That's a different question. But let us emphasize the point. There is absolutely no danger 
of a fascist or even a Bonapartist reaction in any country of Europe at this particular point. Of course, in the future that can change. But the fact of the matter is that the European bourgeoisie over the last 60 years has accumulated a big layer of fat and it does not yet require the services of the fascists. On the contrary, the fascists complicate life for them. That is why in Greece where the Golden Dawn was a fa it is a fascist uh, organization. It is fascist. And it got quite a lot of, it, it grew to a certain level. But the Greek ruling class, which by the way is a particularly vicious and brutal uh, ruling class, that would not hesitate to wade through wade up to their knees in blood if necessary. And undoubtedly at least a section of them would like to impose some kind of a fascist or Bonapartist regime. They did that in 1967, you know. The, the Greek junta, where, where the colonels took power, the Greek the junta. A very vicious regime. It was a Bonapartist regime, military Bonapartist regime, which imitated the methods of fascism. Torture, murder, and so on and so forth. Yes. But you see, the Greek workers and the Greek youth have got long memories. That junta, by the way, was overthrown by a revolution in Greece in 1974. Which opened a period of revolution in Greece. Which is very dangerous for Greek capitalism. Every year the Greek, uh, it started with the students actually in the Polytechnic. And, and every year the Polytechnic, the, the, these events are ce celebrated, they, they're remembered. The Greek workers know what fascism is, they know what Bonaparte, they know what dictatorship is. And the Greek working class has not been defeated, its forces is intact. I think, I think Ilya said there were 44 general strikes. I've forgotten how many general strikes. And you, in, in Greece. And you saw the enormous power of the Greek masses in, in the referendum just last year, 12 months ago. That showed the real balance of forces in Greece. You know, Tsipras, this uh, timid uh, left reformist. Like all the left reformers, he's afraid of everything. He's afraid of the bourgeois. He's afraid of Merkel. I think he's afraid of his own shadow. He's afra afraid of the sound of his own voice. Yes. But this uh, timid reformist, who by the way had the delusion that he was, he was going to convince Merkel, you know, with Varoufakis the same. These are the realists, you know, these are the realists. They thought they, they would talk to Frau Merkel and Frau Merkel would be reasonable. They would say, look, Frau Merkel, they haven't can get, we got no money. Then the Paris Paris, no money. We can't pay. Which is the truth. And Merkel, be, being a, a lady which is a soft heart, 
you know. And said, okay, okay, forget about the debt. Pay, pay when you can. They, they, really, they really believed that. Farah Melka did not say that. She said, nein. <laughs> Und nein. No way. Pay us, pay us. You got no food, don't eat. You got no houses, live on the streets. You got no hospitals, die. But pay us what you owe. I just wrote a long article about Shakespeare. Just, it reminds me of the merchant of Venice, you know, Shylock. Pound of flesh, give me the pound of flesh. But Cyprus, he, he did one thing he did that was right. He called a referendum. You for or against the proposals of the Troika? I think he was hoping to lose. He was hoping to lose, I think so. And then he could say, well, what can I do? The, the Greek masses voted massively. No, okay, no. Now, if Tsipras would have been a, a genuine left, so not a Marxist, but a genuine left. If he had a little bit of courage, he would have used that position of strength to say to Merkel, we are not paying you a single sentiment, se cent, nothing. Do what you like. They would, of course, it, it, it try to take steps against Greece. And then the, he said, well, okay, you want to play hardball. We'll pass, a, 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 by decree, we'll pass a decree law. To expropriate all the banks, starting with the German banks, ex expropriate all the banks. And all the big uh, companies. And all the big ship owners. And I'll tell you something, if he'd have done that, the Greek people would have been dancing in the streets, I'm telling you. But you see, what is the general significance of the events in France, which I was describing? Everywhere, in all countries, not just in Europe, but in the United States. The masses are struggling to find a way out of this crisis. That is the reason. Because they look first to one party, then to another party. And you see how quickly the situation changes. With lightning speed, as Comrade Pepe correctly said. You know, parties which have existed for decades can be wiped out in a short time. I think some of our comrades have not grasped this fact. I'm afraid that they, con they, 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 think, that because they think in terms of, of a past period. When, when, when politics was stable, when political parties were stable. And the consensus is shaped by that. If I'm, if I'm to be a little bit unkind, I sometimes detect an element of mental laziness in the part of St. Thomas. An inability to understand that as of 2008, there has been a fundamental break in the situation. Some comrades are a bit, uh, some comrades are a bit impatient, you know. I heard, I heard this so many times. 
And they say, well, okay, okay, so there's the, the, the biggest crisis in capitalism. Biggest crisis in history. Where's the revolution? I think we should send these comments back to nursery school. You know, give, give them some milk and biscuits and send them back to, to play with toys. You know. You have to follow the process as it unfolds. We have said many times, and I, I, I don't apologize for repeating. We are dialectical materialists, not idealists. Human consciousness in general is not a progressive thing. It is profoundly conservative. Most people do not like change. They're afraid of change. Yes, but they, uh, therefore they will cling, with t tenaciously they will cling to the existing order, the existing morality, the existing ideas, the existing religion, the existing political parties, the existing leaders, until an earthquake shatters the, 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 this routine. This routine which weighs like a dead weight, like a lead weight on the consciousness of the masses. And it's shattered. Because beneath the surface for the last eight years, attack after attack after attack, Rob just passed me the figures, which are quite interesting. Since 2009, what countries in Europe do you think suffered the biggest fall in real wages? Don't answer, I'll put you out of your misery. Greece, Portugal, and Britain. Oh yes, perhaps that tells you something. But Britain has suffered, the British working class has suffered the biggest drop in real wages of any country in Europe except for Greece. That's it. And, and beneath the surface in Britain and everywhere else, there's been a slow buildup of, of resentment, of, of discontent, of bitterness. Looking for an outlet and there was no outlet. The Labour Party in Britain until Corbyn came on the scene. was most decidedly not an outlet. Nobody in their wildest dreams could claim that it was an outlet. This disgusting Blairite gang. That was the reason for the political earthquake in Scotland. The Labour Party had virtually a monopoly for decades in Scotland. I'll deal with that in the national question. But it's been smashed. They've got one MP now in the whole of Scotland. Same as the Conservatives. You know, there's this burning discontent that exists. And because the reformists are not able to satisfy the uh, aspirations of the people, it's, the, it's historically the role of the social democracy to deceive the workers with false promises. They get elected, they betray, and it produces enormous disappointment and of course, the right wing and the, the bourgeois, they say, 
There you are, you see. You wanted socialism? That's socialism. That's the socialists. And in France, that's, that's what occurred. Our own cut it, carried out worse cuts, deeper cuts, worse reforms. And that produces a violent reaction to the left and to the right. And all that that means is that the masses are seeking a way out of the crisis somehow. But you have to see the way the situation develops. In the 1970s, after 1973, it was the first major world recession since the Second World War. There was, well, some of us have lived through that period. Revolution in Greece, revolution in Portugal, where the dictatorship was overthrown after 40 years. Revolution in Spain, revolution in Spain, which some of the communists present and myself participated in that. Mass revolutionary strikes uh, and, and movements in Italy. And everywhere there was a ferment in the uh, socialist parties in particular, which swung sharply to the left. Now, we are moving into a similar situation to that, I'm convinced of this. And we have to prepare for this. But you see, history repeats itself. But it doesn't repeat itself in the same way. But there are differences. The main difference is that the degeneration of the, of the mass reformist parties, the so social democratic parties, in many countries, especially in the south of Europe, has reached such a critical point of, of rottenness that they seem no long, they're no longer capable of reflecting that move, which they, which they did in the past. They become so bourgeoisified and they are so remote from, from the real world of the working class that they, they, can't, even, they, can't, even, they, don't, they can't even reflect the mood that, of what's taking place down below. Now, and therefore, they, they, can be, they can even be destroyed or severely weakened. In the case of Greece, for decades, PASOK was the main party of the working class. But on the basis of revolutionary events, PASOK has been destroyed. I don't know whether it will come back. I doubt it. It doesn't seem very likely. Although I suppose anything is possible. But it's not likely. In, 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 in Spain, you saw that in the elections. Socialist Party had the worst result, I think, in, in its history. And you have the rise of Podemos. Now, I'm, I'm running out of time. But I must, I've just touched upon the crisis in Europe. It isn't just confined to the countries that I've mentioned. But I think it would be wrong of me not to deal with the process, at least briefly. The same process, by the way, which is developing on the other side of the Atlantic. Where also there's a political earthquake. Tremendous consequences. Now just think about this, Congress. Just think. Just 18 months ago, I think that hardly anyone in the USA had heard of Bernie Sanders. 
But if you people in his local area, everybody had heard of Hillary Clinton. But when Bernie Sanders stood as a, although he stood as a Democrat candidate, as a democratic socialist, as, as he describes himself. There was an immediate response, a massive response, especially from the youth. He had a campaign with mass meetings. Everywhere he spoke, there were mass meetings. Tens of thousands and tens of thousands. Even in Texas, where I think there were two meetings. Of, I think about 10,000, I can't remember. But anyway, they were, they were massive meetings and enthusiastic meetings. Now, you see, from, a, from the standpoint of scientific Marxism, you can say that Sanders is very confused, his message is very ambiguous. You can say that. You could say that. You could, say that. You could have said that about Sanders, too. And you can say it about Corbyn. And you'd be right. But that is entirely irrelevant. That's not the point. When Sanders stands up in a meeting and, and talks about a political revolution against the billionaire class, you could say, well, what does it mean? What's, what's a political revolution? You could say that. But you'd be wrong. Because the, the thousands of enthusiastic youth present at that meeting, they know what it means. Or rather, they put their own interpretation on it. Which uh, probably wouldn't be that of Sanders. He, he didn't win it, and we didn't expect him to. But actually, it's now emerged. In the last few days, WikiLeaks published the fact that it was the democratic bureaucracy, the, 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 the bureaucracy of the Democratic Party, that deliberately organized a campaign to undermine Sanders. And when the delegates at the Congress heard this, there was uproar. I think many of them turned up at the convention with Bernie Sanders t-shirts, with Bernie for president. And of course, Bernie Sanders himself, as we thought, was, was most likely. There was a small possibility he might have said, well, I don't accept this. You could have had the same courage as Ted, Ted uh, Cruz in the, the Republican Party. I'm not accepting Trump. Don't recognize him. And that could have been the basis of the formation of a mass socialist party in America. There's no question about it. But the basis was there. But like all reformists and left reformists, in the moment of truth, he backed down under pressure and recognized Hillary Clinton, who is hated, of course, by many Americans. On the basis of, we've got to fight against Trump, Trump is bad, Trump is a racist. But apparently, I think John will fill in this, but apparently when he spoke, he had his own meeting prior to the uh, official convention, And tried to explain this betrayal, in effect. He tried to explain this to his supporters. And he met with a barrage of uh, the people who were, who were outraged, protests. And people were chanting that uh, Bernie, Bernie for president or whatever they chant, Bernie Sanders. 
And they're still chanting now inside the uh, democratic convention. Now, you, you can say, and you'd be right, Bernie Sanders is just an accident of the cabinet, so he is. But the, uh, what he's stirred up, he may disappear, he will disappear. But the questions that were raised by his campaigns and this move that is the radical move that exists, that will remain. And therefore will open up tremendous possibilities to the very, for the very excellent commons we have in the United States. Who, by the way, have done marvelous work. And the building, building a serious section. I'm told that they sold 150 copies of the paper at the Democratic Convention. Yeah, before it started. They had a slight problem of a mistake of perspective, however. As happens in many sections, comments, so don't. Uh, don't smile too much. I'm speaking about you. How many times have you heard this? We could have sold more papers than we run out of papers. The next comment that tells me that, I will reserve the right to strangle them with my bare hands and I will do it slowly. Then you can complain to the, uh, the committee that they've set up to deal with, to, to deal with to deal with minor issues. No, no, no it, is, it is a marvelous success. I mean, who would have thought 150 papers before the Congress starts? And the Commons had to go all the way back to New York to print more papers. Oh, by the way, I can't, I can't leave this without mentioning the other convention, which is also extraordinary. The Republican Party convention with Donald Trump. You know, amazing. You've never seen anything like it. I, I don't think there's any precedent for this. Never. He's he, he says won an overwhelming majority. And he came there to be crowned, crowned king of the Republicans, you know. I mean, the, the American tradition, I think, with the, 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 the brass bands and the, the razzmatazz and the balloons and so on. And, you know. Here comes the president, or whatever they call it. Instead of that, there was uproar. Up, there was a riot. A riot. The, Democrat, the Republican Party split down a little. Was it uh, Colorado that walked out? Which went, which went Colorado, was it? It walked out. The whole delegation walked out. There was uproar, boos, hissing, shouting. And then, of course, Mrs. Trump comes to the microphone. And, and makes a very brilliant and very original speech which demonstrates her high intellectual level and as you know is copied literally from the speech of Mrs. Obama. Yes, very amusing. But think, think what does it mean? Do you think for one minute that that was an accident? I mean, the scriptwriters of the Republican Party may be pretty thick. But they're not that thick. It's impossible to make a mistake of that character. It was deliberate sabotage. Because the establishment of the Republican Party I'm big business. 
Is that, is that any before I spoke? Come up, come up, come up and give the speech. <laughs> Anna can read my mind, you see. This time he didn't read it correctly. <laughs> I said the establishment of the Republican Party and big business is desperate to stop Trump from uh, becoming president. Because he's too unpredictable. And he says things which are very uh, awkward for the ruling class. Making demagogic appeals. But what's the real, I'll finish for lack of time, but what's the real meaning of this in the States? Just think of the real significance of these. What does it mean? For generations, I don't know how long, for a century, more than a century. America, America has been run by two parties, two big parties. You know, Gore Vidal, who, as, as you know, is my favorite American writer, he said the following. Our republic, that's America, our republic has one party, the property party, with two right wings. And that's an accurate description. But just look. It's breaking up before your eyes. It's breaking down. And this is serious. What, and what it shows is the same process that I described in Britain, in Spain, and elsewhere. Same process. The American dream is finished. It's now official. The next generation in the USA will have lower living standards than the previous generation. I think that's the first time in history. First time ever. And there's the same mood of, of bitterness, of anger, of frustration, the same mood in the masses, in America. And the sense of alienation and a burning feeling that these people in Congress do not represent us. That's at the basis of it. And that's a potential, a potentially revolutionary, a potentially revolutionary implication. But the, the establishment is desperately trying to prevent the breakup of the two party system. To prevent what they call the political center. What they're really afraid of, they're trying to prevent it, but they cannot prevent it, is a sharp polarization to the left and to the right. And that's what you saw in this uh, elect electoral campaign. It's the, it's the outline. Of, of a sharp polarization in America to the right and to the left. Which has huge implications for the future. What am I saying? Am I saying that next Monday the red flag will be flying over the White House? Coming over there and saying yes. <laughs> take note, John, take note. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. It will take time. There'll be many ups and downs. But the process everywhere, everywhere, without any exception, is moving swiftly in the, in the same direction. A revolutionary direction. And all that is missing in this huge global equation is just one thing. But it is the decisive thing. It is the subjective fact. 
That's all that's missing to bring these revolutionary processes to a successful conclusion. Comrades, that is our role. Comrades, we must prepare ourselves. That's the meaning of this context. We must prepare ourselves for the titanic events which are being prepared. And if we, do, if we do our duty, every single one of us, then the future of the IMT and the future of the world proletarian revolution is guaranteed.